Okay, well, our text this morning is Psalm 103, but more specifically, just what we see in the first two verses. So let me read those for you again, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. David writes this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. So what I want us to focus on this morning is what does it mean to bless the Lord? And what are these benefits uh, that we are not to forget? You know, again, what I want, to, want us to focus on are specifically what we would call the non-redemptive blessings or the common blessings God gives to all mankind. Now again, let me just remind all of us that we have been looking at the fact that Christianity is a religion of love, okay? It's all about God's love and sending His Son for us in Jesus' love and coming to take away our guilt and to clothe us with His righteousness that we might be justified. But we don't want to forget the second part of the equation, and that is in His sending His Spirit into our hearts so that we might be sanctified, that we might love God and love the Lord Jesus in return, that we might become like Him. Now, as we were talking about um, the book of Jonah, actually, on uh, Wednesday, it, it, it struck me again the differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And really, this is the way in which those two covenants are different. We know that when God brought His people out of Egypt, He commanded them to love. Okay? He told them to keep His commandments, the ones delivered to them on Sinai, those Ten Commandments. Well, we know those Ten Commandments are really a, um, uh, what do you want to say, it's, a, it's a, the standard of how we are to love. But they failed. Okay? They failed because that covenant, we're told, as God introduces the new covenant, that covenant could not give them the power to love in the way that he called them to love. And so God says he's going to make a new covenant, a covenant that would give them that ability. And he, you know, the author to the Hebrews quoting Jeremiah writes in Hebrews 8, verses 8 and 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, that covenant is the covenant that we are in through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has justified us by His work, and we now love Him by His Spirit. By the way, remember the indictment against God's people that He brought out of Egypt? They did not continue in my ways. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. The new covenant rectifies that. God puts his love in our hearts so that we will obey him. And so God will be pleased in what he sees in us. Now, let's remember, though, this, something else we've been looking at, that <clears throat> this bestowal of the Holy Spirit, this implantation of love in our hearts, is not, it's not the end. Okay? It's not the goal. It's not the perfection. It's really just the beginning, the very you know, starting point. We need to grow in this love until we become like Jesus. And I think this is something that we often forget, that sanctification requires effort on our part. So we've been considering how we are to do this, and we've kind of backed up and we're going at it from just sort of square one. And the first step was this that we need to be convinced that God exists. Remember what the author to the Hebrews said in Hebrews 11, verse 6. He who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. We know that we're never really going to love someone um, unless we're sure that they're real. We're never going to love God unless we're convinced that He is. Now, I, again, I realize that we're here We've made a profession of faith in, in Christ. We, we, we say that we believe these things, but I'm wondering how often it really dawns on us what that means. The reality of God, the fact that He is and that He is everywhere. 
and that he is one who is most to be loved. Okay? We cannot really love him as we should unless we are fully convinced and live at all times in the presence of God. But we also saw, secondly, that we need to know what this God is like. Okay? We need to know that he is worthy to be loved. You might say to know him is to love him, right? And the more we know him, the more we will love him. Now, we can learn a great deal about God through the creation. We saw this in the apologetic series. There, there is so much we can learn that renders everybody without excuse. But there are certain things that we will never learn about God in the creation, and certainly not as clearly as we see them in the Bible. And that are, it's really those things that make him most lovely, and that is his love and his grace and his mercy. Those are revealed to us most powerfully through the gospel. And the gospel is only revealed in the Bible. And that's why we need it. And why we need to be convinced that the Bible is his word. Because it's here that God reveals himself most clearly. So we really do need to consider. We need to look at the Bible to see why it is we should love God. And what I'd like to do as we think about these things, and again, like I say, we're starting in pretty, pretty basic stuff. Um, I'd like us to begin with those common blessings that God has given to us that maybe don't directly have to do with redemption, but things he has given to us and things for which we ought to love him. Now, David tells us in Psalm 103 that though we... We honor God for his salvation, that there are other things that we should never forget and that we should love him for those things as well. Uh, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Now, first of all, I want us to, to, to notice, okay, that even though David is really calling on himself, you know, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, he really intends this for the entire congregation, doesn't he? Because the Psalms are written for, for public worship, and they were sung in public worship. And this is an example that he is giving to the congregation that they should do likewise, which means that this example is meant to spur us to do the same thing. Secondly, I want you to notice what David calls us to do first, which is to bless the Lord. Now, I think when we usually hear this, what we think that he is telling us to do is, is to do this. Bless you, Lord. You know? I thank you, Lord. Okay? That, that that is what it means to bless the Lord, by saying, I bless you, Lord. Uh, but that isn't really what it means. The word actually means to adore him with bended knee. I adore you, my God, in this, you know, I, I express my, my love to you, my ardent love to you humbly, okay? So that's what we're being called to do. And then thirdly, David calls us to do this with not just part of our being, but with our whole being, okay? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, I hope that sounds familiar because this is what Jesus calls us to do, isn't it? He says this is what the greatest commandment is, to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, I love you with, with all that is within me. That's, that's what David is, is saying. And fourthly, he says this. He tells us that for which we are to love him. And by the way, you know, it's, it's the redemptive blessings, yes. It's the common blessings we're going to be looking at, yes. But we don't want to forget God is lovely and he is worthy to be loved. But what he tells us is this. We should bless him for all the good that he gives us he says, and forget none of his benefits. Now, again, I know when we think of these benefits, our minds usually go directly to those greatest benefits that he has given to us, sending his son into the world to save us. And that's the way our minds should work because that is the greatest blessing that he has given to us. 
But what David is reminding us is this as well. We are to adore him humbly for all the other benefits that he gives to us as well, those that we often take for granted. By the way, those, these are the blessings we often would think about on Thanksgiving, right? What are you thankful for? You know, we used to have these Thanksgiving services and we'd maybe get up and give a personal testimony. What are you thankful for? Well, I'm thankful for my wife, my family. I'm thankful for this and that. These are the things we usually think of at Thanksgiving. You know, all the material blessings God has given to us, the common blessings, but, you know, we also get up, of course, and say, thank you, Lord, for giving us your son because he has saved us. You have saved us through him. And, of course, all these blessings come from him. But this morning, again, I want us to focus on some of these blessings that we often take for granted. And as we think about them, hopefully, you know, if there are things we haven't thought of for a while, let's remember to give God the glory and the thanks and the honor and the praise and let these things stir us up to love him even more. Now, you know, one of the indictments that the Lord makes against the human race is that knowing that God is the source of all these good things, they don't honor him or give him thanks, right? That's what Paul says in Romans 1. We just need to make sure that we don't fall in that same category. So first of all, he says, we should love him. I should say, first of all, we should love him because he made us. Again, we want to start with the basics. We want to start at the beginning. This is the beginning. And when is the last time that you thank God for making you, for creating you, for your existence. You know, David did this in Psalm 139, verse 14, where he writes this. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. You know, God has made us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, just as David was as well. At the moment of conception, God created our bodies. And at that same moment, he created our souls, right? And, you know, again, the idea is that we would not exist if God had not made us. And so obviously we owe him everything, okay? Everything we are, we owe to him. But we wouldn't also be who we are if he hadn't determined to make us exactly who we are. You know, Paul talks about how husbands ought to love their wives as their own flesh because no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it. We love ourselves, right? Well, God is the one who made us the way we are. We should thank him for the things that we perhaps see in ourselves that we think are praiseworthy. We need to love him for those gifts. We need to love him for those strengths. And we need to realize at the same time that all the weaknesses we have are not, not things he, he gave to us. That, that's the result of the fall. But every good thing we have comes from him. God planned when we would come into existence. Have you ever thought about that? You know, I mean, you look back when you're studying history, the history of the world, and you think about things that happened, you know, during, well, you read the Bible during the flood, Pre-flood era, you know, post-flood era, you think about what happened in Rome, Persia, all these various countries, World War II. I mean, all, these, all this history has already gone by. But God determined that you and I would be born at this particular time. By the way, think about, think about some of the, you know, the physical issues that we've, you know, had to go through already. I, when I was uh, growing up, I was in elementary school. I came down with scarlet fever. You know, scarlet fever would have been something that would have killed you, you know, a little while ago. But thankfully, there were drugs that can combat it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And I'm sure that may be the case with many of us here. You know, there are technologies that exist right now that didn't exist if we had lived a century ago. And we should be thankful for those things. You know, the Lord also planned where we would come into existence. You know, in this country, and not in a more oppressive one. You know, I often think about when I've, when I've read about um, cultures that are cannibalistic and how one, you know, one tribe would attack another tribe and then they would, you know, capture the women and then they would, 
you know, kill the men or maybe eat them, you know, and then they would bring the women and they, you know, impregnate them and then they would eat their babies, you know. That, that's horrible. That's awful. But those are human beings that are, that are being treated that way. We could have been one of those babies, right? But God put us in this country. Now, this country has a lot of problems. It has a lot of shortcomings. But I think we still receive a lot of blessings here. Now, this isn't our focus this morning, but we should be thankful that we were born in this country at a time when the gospel had reached us. You know, so we're born at a time and in a place where we heard the gospel call because without that, we would have no hope. We need to remember that there are still people being born today in various countries that will likely never hear the gospel in their entire lifetime, and they will die, and they will perish. We were born, again, at a time and a place where we received the gospel, and we should thank God for that mercy. Now, secondly, we should love Him because when God made us, He made us like Himself. That's a great blessing, too. Genesis 1.27, Moses writes this, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. You know, God is sovereign. God really could have made us anything He chose. But He chose to make us human beings and not lower forms of life, okay? That's something we also should not take for granted. And God, when He made us, made us like Himself. He shared certain characteristics, certain qualities that are His with us. So unlike the animals, we can think, you know, we have the ability to understand things and we have an imagination, you know, that can put things together, we can figure things out. He made us moral creatures, so we can make morally significant choices. He made us purposeful beings so we can make plans and we can carry those plans out. And the Lord has also given to us, we might say, an eternal constitution. That part of us which can think and purpose and can make morally significant choices, that part of us is never going to go out of existence, but it's going to, to last forever, not because we are in and of ourselves eternal, but because God has determined that we will never cease to exist. There is no soul sleep, okay? There is life after death, and we will continue on forever. But God made us like Himself so that we could see and understand His glory, so that we could worship Him, so that we could praise Him, so that we could know Him, so that we could love Him. I mean, that was His original plan. The Bible says that all mankind are really the children, the offspring of God. Okay, we are his sons and his daughters. Remember what Paul says, quoting the Greek poets at the Areopagus, for we also are his children. And by that, he included all the pagan philosophers as well. Okay? God desired to have a family, so to speak, to be a father to us. But sadly, even though we were his children, we fell away in Adam, and now we need redemption. But even if He hadn't redeemed us, we need to remember it's still a great blessing to be in the image of God. God has been good to us by making us the highest of His creatures, and so we should thank Him and praise Him for this, just as the angels do, by the way. You know, God made all the angels as well, and He has His elect angels, and there are angels that fell away, and you can believe that those elect angels are very thankful to God for making them what He has made them, and also for preserving them. Now, thirdly, we should thank Him not only because he, he made us and made us like Him, but obviously God also cares for us. He gives us all the good things that we have to enjoy in life. He feeds us. The psalmist writes in Psalm 104, verses 13 and 14, He waters the mountains from His upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of His works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth. 
You know what Paul said regarding the gospel work, that one plants, you know, another waters, but God causes the growth? The same thing is true with regard to the, the food that we have to enjoy. We plant the seeds which God has made. He grants the rain. He grants the sunshine. He causes it to grow. And he's also ordained that these plants would nourish us. You know, just think about the abundance of food that God has actually put into this world. That is a part of his kindness and his goodness to us, for which we should love him. He's the one who gives us clothing. He gives us shelter to protect us from the elements. He gives us strength and ability to do the work that we do so that we can provide for ourselves. And by the way, he also gives to us government to protect our lives, to establish these businesses so that we can work and we can provide for our needs. He gives us family. He gives us friends. He gave us parents to care for us. He gave us brothers and sisters to support us. He gave many of us spouses to be our companions. And he gave us children. Children are obviously a blessing from the Lord to love and to nurture them. And you know, that's true even if those children don't believe in the Lord. We, we know they're still a blessing. We still love them, and we still thank God for them because they are a mercy that God has shown to us. And by the way, when I'm, when I'm talking about this catalog of blessings that God has given, we need to realize that sin has ruined a lot of these things, okay? Many of us perhaps don't have some of these blessings, but all of us have some, and these blessings are still a mercy that we do not deserve. This is God's care for us, and so we should thank Him and love Him for these things. Now, fourthly, God gives us enjoyment in this world. Just think about it. God has filled this world with so many good things, and He has given us the ability to enjoy these things. Now, again, this is something we don't often think about as far as the ability to enjoy them until something happens to maybe threaten or take those abilities away. He gives us sight so we can see the beauty that He has created in the creation. You know, every time I, I, I see snow-capped mountains or when we go out to the ocean, you know, and just look at the vastness of, of, of that body of water, when you look at a field of all the different colors of, of flowers or during the fall when the trees, you know, turn a fiery red or all these various colors, I've seen uh, a group of trees one time that looked like a, literally like a bowl of Fruit Loops. It had so many colors, purples and greens, and yellows and reds, just beautiful. And we go to the zoo and we look at all the creatures he's made, or maybe you watch Planet Earth, you know, and you see just all those ecosystems that God has created. He's filled this world with so many good things to, to look at. And without sight, we would never know about any of those things. You know, Jonathan Edwards talked about, he uses the example of trying to describe God's, the, the beauty of God's holiness to a person who is unconverted. He says it's like trying to explain color to a person who's blind. You, you would have no concept of what color is if you'd never seen it. And the same thing is true with regard to God's grace. But again, the point is, God has given us eyes to see all this beauty, not just his beauty, but the beauty of his creation. He gave us hearing so that we could hear the beautiful sounds that, that can be made. We can hear music, melody, and, and harmony. By the way, we can also communicate with each other because we can hear. He's given us taste so we can taste all the wonderful flavors. You know, you, I don't know if you ever watch any of those shows like MasterChef, you know, where they're taking all these foods and creating all these things, and people get paid a lot of money for putting these things together in such a way that they taste so good. Th those tastes wouldn't exist without God's goodness. And our ability to taste those things wouldn't exist apart from God's goodness. We need, to, again, to thank Him for these things. Smell, to enhance the flavor. People, you know, when you get a cold and you can't smell, you also can't taste very well but it's because you can't smell. The aroma is not getting in there. But God has made so many different smells to enjoy. And of course, he's also given us the sensation of touch, which not only warns us, you know, when you're doing something that may be dangerous, touching something that's hot, but it also allows us to feel the comfort of friends and, 
and maybe loved ones during those difficult times. Now again, we realize God has not given all of these gifts to everyone. You know, sin has destroyed the perfect world that he's made, but that is what he gave, what he intended. And even though sin has destroyed it, we all of us still enjoy so many of these things. All of us would have to say regardless, and that would be true of everyone on the planet, all of us has far more of these mercies than we deserve because we don't deserve any of them, right? Again, Bob Needham, our, our dear brother and a retired pastor and retired chaplain, would often say, what is it that we do deserve? What is it that everyone in this world deserves? We deserve hell. And the fact that we're not getting that, okay, but that we're getting life and we're getting all these blessings, okay? We have, everyone has a reason to thank God for those things, but particularly those of us who know the Lord, who have come into a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ purely by His grace. And that's obviously something we're going to want to look at later, uh, next time. But finally, I just want us to remember that even these gifts, even these common gifts, they're only here because of Christ, okay? And that is true for everyone. Everyone receives the good things they receive only because of the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if God had not planned to redeem us, there would have been no reason for the creation to continue after the fall. God would have destroyed everything, okay? His plan to redeem a people is the reason why He continues to sustain the world, and why he continues to provide for the world. Now, he does this because he's good, and because everyone is, we're all his children. And he is a faithful father who provides for his children. But he also does it to preserve the world so he could send his son into the world so that he could reveal to the world his great mercy and grace by giving Jesus to save us. By the way, that's one of the reasons why he wants us to share Christ with others is because he wants them to see what he has done. And if we don't tell him, tell them what he has done, they're, they're not going to see it. That's the reason why he wants us to um, do the work of missions. So the people, even the people who aren't his, his sheep, the people who aren't going to respond, they're still going to hear about the glory of God. They're still going to be reminded of what he has done even if they reject it, God wants them to know about it. He wants them to see it, or at least be reminded of it. And we know as we do that, God's going to call his people out of the world. But God is good. God has been good. He has been good to us. And so let's remember to respond to this exhortation of David and not just say, thank you, Lord, and not just say, I bless you, Lord but rather to adore Him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for His infinite kindnesses to us through Christ in creating and sustaining us, in making us in His image so that we might know Him, in caring and providing for us, and in giving to us the ability to enjoy this creation all because of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the Lord, adore Him, and forget none of His benefits. Well, may the Lord help us to do that. Let's, let's bow in just a moment of prayer, and let's ask for His grace that we might forget none of them.